Welcome back to Sahara TV. My name is Rudolf Okonkwo. In continuation of our coverage of the 2015 election, we are honored to bring you unique voices from Nigeria at home and abroad. And we went all the way to Germany to bring you Dr. Emmanuel Franklin Obumweze. He's the director, African Department, and board member of the Governing Council at the International Society for Human Rights. Dr. Obumweze, welcome to Sahara TV. Thank you, Rodolph, and good evening, viewers. Uh, let's start by um, talking about the current situation in the country. We are two weeks away from the election. And um, how do you assess the current situation in the country politically? Well, election seasons are seasons of anomie in Nigeria since uh, Nigerian history started. And uh, this season has been a very silly one because the campaign uh, for the uh, presidency has degenerated into a festival of uh, throwing ad hominems at our opponents instead of discussing the fundamental issues that Nigerians actually really need to hear to determine effectively who should be the president of that country of ours. And nobody's talking about how to fund and finance the programs that both parties are throwing out there. All they are talking about is whether somebody has a certificate or not. And that is a very silly thing to be doing at this point and at this stage in the campaign. Now, I'm talking about distractions and things that are not relevant. I want to get your opinion on the new court decision that says that INEC must register the Young Democratic Party and have them on the ballots on election day. Now, this is happening a few weeks to the elections. What do you think about that decision? And do you think that there is a way for INEC to abide by this court ruling and still have the election, the presidential election, happen on the 28th of March? Well, thanks a lot. I think that uh, although that de decision uh, seems to be unfortunate because it's uh, very late in the day to register a new party to contest for the election, uh, INEC is a democratic institution in a democratic society. So INEC should obey the court order unless INEC is ready to go to court to get that judgment quashed, INEC should be able to abide by the decision of a court of competent jurisdiction. But the point lies in the fact that one, a lot of people, myself included, will see this as a distraction from a few people who really want to want to scuttle the elections. And uh, no matter what, INEC should not be forced to shift the date of the elections once more. We have had that before, and Nigerians cannot abide having that again. It's a very dangerous signal to the polity at the moment, if we are to shift this election, Nigerians really have to go to the polls to elect and determine in a free and fair manner who should be their president. Mm. Now, let's talk about the issue of PVC and the card reader. There are still some political parties that are out there pushing for the elimination of those um, technical technological systems in this election. They said they don't want that to be used. Why do you think that a country like Mali could use that in their elections while a country like Nigeria could not? You know, what is what's the difference? Why is it that we couldn't do that? Well, the difference is so very simple. So many Nigerians think like people from the third century. Today we are using computers and we are using cell phones and a common PVC and card reader we cannot use for to conduct a credible election. The point lies in that one, a lot of people want to scuttle this election. They don't want it to hold and they are doing everything. They are throwing the dirty water at everybody who tries to su uh, suggest something that will be useful. So they don't want the card reader because they want an opportunity to rig. And uh, Nigerians should be very careful. If these elections are rigged, there's going to be trouble the way the clouds are gathering at the moment. So mm -hmm. they should let the INEC organize a credible election. INEC say it is capable of doing that. They should be given the benefits of the doubt to do that. At this point in time, Nigerians really want the change to happen. But whether the, 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 the both candidates could represent change is uh, what is questionable. But actually, Nigerians are tired of a corrupt and entrenched system that gives no hoot about their welfare. Mm. Now, we continue to hear that the INEC chairman could be sent on terminal leave by the president. What do you think will be the impact of that, if that should happen. The president continues to say he's not going to do that, but we hear from people supporting the president saying that that has to be done. 
Well, the people around the president, uh, you know, they are not giving him uh, a, a good and credible advice if they are insisting on, letting, on dismissing the INEC chairman at the moment. You know, that sounds very suspect. Uh, you cannot remove a referee in the middle of a game. Nobody does that. So it's a very silly suggestion. And Nigerians should not even listen to that. The president, the question is whether he has the power to remove an INEC president. Yeah, uh, whether the INEC president is serving at the, at the good pleasure of the president. What did the Constitution say about that? So these are issues that Nigerians should actually discuss about. But changing the INEC chairman in the middle of a game is a very unwise decision. Sorry, the president will be superlatively stupid to take that decision at this time. Mm. Now, let, let's go to the opposition, uh, Buhari as the presidential candidate. Despite all the talks from the Buhari's camp that he's healthy, it continues to be a major issue in this campaign. How do you assess it from where you are in terms of Buhari's health and what it means for this uh, election? Well, I wouldn't think that, that that should be an issue. The issue should be Buhari has been seen on the campaign trail. He has not up till this time collapsed anywhere so that we see. So the issue lies another one. What Nigerians should be thinking and talking about is what has Buhari got to offer Nigeria this time? If he is the man to deliver Nigeria from the, you know, entropy, uh, from the, uh, you know, atrophy, uh, atrophized situation that we are in at the moment, so be it. His health are uh, just... Uh, as an issue uh, by, uh, raised by people who have nothing important or serious to discuss. I wouldn't think that very health should be an issue for this election. Although Nigerians deserve the right to have a healthy president, we saw what happened to Omar Yaradua. That may be the fears of, in some quarters that what happened to Yaradua may happen to Buhari, a president dying in office. But I don't see that in Buhari's case because Buhari's case is quite different from Yaradua's case. Yerado was an imposition. Obasanjo imposed him on Nigerians. Obasanjo knew he had the intelligence briefing that this guy was deadly sick. And then he went on ahead to impose him on Nigerians. So Buhari is not being imposed by anybody. Buhari seems to be riding a crest of popular support at the moment because Nigerians are superlatively dissatisfied with what the present government has been able to achieve. So mm. that should not be an issue at all. Mm. Buhari should go on to context. If people have credible reasons why he should be disqualified, let them bring it forward. But at, at this time, I haven't seen any. Mm. Okay, let, let's look at one of the major campaigners for Jonathan, who is the wife of patient Jonathan. Recently, she said that people who are talking about change and campaigning for change should be stoned. That led to the APC saying that they will report her to the ICC, that's the International Criminal Court. Now, I know you're a human rights attorney, and do you think there is any case to be made out of that statement? Well, there is no case to be made, actually. Um, uh, well, if they call it inciting, inciting people to violence, the Nigerian courts are adequately empowered and uh, have the relevant laws to tackle such issues. So they should start their litigation at the local level before going to the ICC. So we have courts in Nigeria of competent jurisdiction. They can handle that. It's not even, we haven't had uh, uh, a violence yet that wasn't based on the incitation by the president's wife. But what I think is that that uh, is an unfortunate submission to be made by, you know, a very high, highly placed uh, woman mm. as she is. And, uh, but we shouldn't read much into that. There is nothing to it. She's just, uh, that's her level of understanding mm. and it's unfortunate. Mm. Okay, let, let's look at Boko Haram because uh, one of the reasons why the election was postponed was to make sure that security situation is under control. And it appears as if the military, they are having upper hands over Boko Haram at the moment. What does that do for the president who is running for re-election? Do you think that people are going to look at it and say, okay, he has done well, we should return him to power? Or that people will look at him and say, oh, why didn't you do this all this while? Well, Rudolf, you know, one of the most uh, important things that is happening in this election cycle is that Nigerians are talking and Nigerians have focused their interest on this election like laser beams. And that is pretty important. They are waking up from their civic apathy, which has been the case all this while. So it's pretty important. Jonathan seems to have his hardcore supporters who believe whatever he does, even if he kills somebody tomorrow in broad daylight, they are going to vote for him. There are Buhari on his own side with the APC have 
hardcore supporters who believe that even if Buhari submits uh, NAPA bills as a this certificate, they are going to vote for him. So both sides have their reasons which are legitimate. That's what politics is all about. We have camps and parties that fight for positions of power and authority. But the issue lies in rather one. Uh, the Nigerian government uh, for so many years have shown marked incompetence of the grotesque, grotesque level when it comes to dealing with local insurgencies like Boko Haram, that the president was, or the, the administration was unable to arrest Boko Haram up to this time, shows either that they underrated what Boko Haram is all about, or they are incompetent to handle Boko Haram. I wouldn't know what that would do for him in this election cycle. The people are already dissatisfied. A lot of people have lost their lives. I lost my sister to a bomb attack by Boko Haram in Kano in 2013. So, you know, almost every other Nigerian uh, knows somebody who has lost somebody. So the issue lies whether one whether that would uh, uh, grant him the kind of momentum he needs to win the election. That is questionable. I don't know about that. Mm. And we will find that out on the election day. Mm. Now, one of the articles you wrote in the past was called uh, Boko Haram, a violent symptom of a rotten embrace. Now, we saw that this week, Boko Haram, they now claim to have a kind of a relationship with ISIS. Do you think is is something meaningful, or do you think they are just trying to grab onto something to continue to exist? What, what do you think about that? Well, I would dismiss that immediately. That's that's simply uh, uh, a symptom of uh, uh, an organization that is losing every power, legitimacy, and uh, they are, it's, it's just a panic reaction to the fact that the military and some mercenaries that the Nigerian government hired uh, getting an upper hand in crushing their insurgency. So they want to uh, attain that international relevance that could be associated with uh, the mention of ISIS. So that's what they need, that's what they crave. And I want Nigerians, it's going to be a very grave error if Nigerians are going to accord them that recognition that we've, that we've been looking for quite some time now. Mm -hmm. We don't need to accord them that. They are a bunch of ragtag criminals that are bent on destabilizing and destroying Nigeria for all its worth. So we should not give them that uh, day in the sun to celebrate their brutality. Mm -hmm. No, Nigerians are more decent than that. Okay, I, I want to talk about Basanjo and what decision he made recently to leave the PDP. And I want you to look at it from this perspective where uh, in, in 2009, you wrote an article called Obasanjo, Another Evil Genius. Mm -hmm. what, what, is, what is your take on Obasanjo's role in this election? I want to tell you that Obasanjo is one of Nigeria's smartest politicians. The point is he has seen that, this, that the ship is sinking, so he is taking his exit before it collapses. He has already calculated his moves. We must not forget that Jonathan and Yeradua were Obasanjo's impositions on Nigerians. He single-handedly imposed these two guys on the Nigerian presidency. Yeradua had no business being the Nigeria's president, but Obasanjo imposed him because he never wanted Peter Odile to uh, rise, and then he wanted to crush him. So Yeradua was the candidate that he used to do that because he knew that Yeradua was not going to last very long, and then maybe that would offer him a back way a back door into coming back to power and relevance. So Obasanjo knows his calculation. But Obasanjo doesn't have the interests of Nigeria at heart. So I wouldn't think that uh, Jonah, he was the one that made Jonathan, because Jonathan came out of nothing. The actual person that was supposed to be the vice president was Alamesia. Alamesia was caught on corruption charges in London. So that made his chances so very slim. And then Jonathan, who was his, who was his uh, deputy governor, became governor, and then to the presidency today. So Obasanjo uh, should not be taken so very seriously at the moment. Obasanjo was a, a part of the problem that Nigeria has been having for quite some time now. Mm -hmm. So we should not uh, uh, mince words in saying that Obasanjo is a part of our problem. And the earlier Nigerians rise up to dismiss this old generation of men who have nothing new to offer us, the better for us. Mm -hmm. They have held our destiny in their hands for too long. Mm -hmm. And Nigeria, where is Nigeria today? We are among the poorest countries in the world. 70% of our population are living below the poverty line. Women are still dying in childbirth. And we are still spending trillions subsidizing oil that is produced in our backyard. And, you know, anybody who knows anything about Nigeria and about how things should work will be so angry and pissed. This was the guy that frittered away $16 billion 
to provide Nigerians electricity. But today we are still in darkness. We don't have power. So how could we take such a politician seriously when he comes with his uh, arguments that uh, he has something to offer? He has nothing to offer us. Absolutely nothing. That's just the point. We should not take him seriously. His problem with Jonathan is just a problem between the elite. They are fighting for it. They don't care about Nigerians. Mm -hmm. Michael Jackson had a song. All, he, all I want to say is that they don't even care about us. They mm -hmm. don't care about Nigerians. Mm -hmm. Nigerians should rise up and take their destiny in their hands. They have the votes now. They should go to the polls and elect somebody who has their interests at heart. Mm -hmm. Not listening to people like Obasanjo. He's a whitewashed sepulchre. That's my assessment of him. All right, uh, we're running out of time. Let me ask you, looking at the geopolitical zones in Nigeria, it appears as if the Southwest is the battleground. Now, do you think that the people in the Southeast, the Igbo people, they've played their politics well? Uh, do you gain by being the battleground, or do you gain by being a territory that is already assigned to a particular political party? Well, we should know that the Southwest has a very unique position, uh, you know, being the major seaport and commercial center of Nigeria. Lagos has always hosted the major uh, newspapers and news media that Nigeria has had since the fight for independence. And we should not lose sight of the fact that the Southwest has always been a battleground. That was where the wait here and their problems started in the 60s that led to the collapse of the First Republic. So uh, being a battleground could have its advantages as well as disadvantages. But the issue lies in whether one, people in the Southwest seems to be more politically aware because they have had a very long history of political activism in that part of Nigeria than every other part. Uh, about the politics, uh, you know, I detest uh, tribal politics. So everything in me rejects that because uh, it's a very primeval a basis for politicking. Religion and tribe. That is the worst basis upon to erect a political affiliation. So I wouldn't be commenting very much on what the Igbos have been able to do. I would want Nigerians to come together as Nigerians, not as Igbo House or Yoruba, and then determine what their future is going to be. Our future has forever been postponed by our political class. Chino Achebe said it in 1983 that the problem and the trouble with Nigeria is simply and squarely the failure of leadership. That problem still persists today. But one thing that Achebe never considered effectively was the role of the followership in creating the kind of situation we have in Nigeria today. So it seems that the followership is waking up. Every society gets the government it deserves. So if Nigerians want to have a very corrupt government, they should keep it that way. If they want to change it, it the, Shakespeare said it. Every bondsman in his hands lies the key to cancel his captivity. So if we want to cancel our captivity, the choice is ours. We have to do that ourselves. Mm. Dr. Manuel Obumwenze, thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure, Rudolf. Thank you very much. Thank you. When we come back, we are going to continue to present you some of our interesting programs. So stay tuned.